thank you all for worshiping with us today. Hallelujah. Come on, we can do better than that for the risen King this morning. Come on, He is a sovereign one. He is the mighty one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, I tell you what, we could, uh, we could probably go home right now because they have absolutely preached the truth today while they have sung. And I'm grateful. Listen, if you do not, I want to be careful. Let me just say it this way. We have no excuse for not worshiping the Lord when we come into this room. There are people who are gifted to play and sing. I was glad to see a new friend up here today uh, playing. I'm glad to see him with Eddie. We have people who are gifted to sing. These people come on Thursday and give of their time to practice, to learn their parts so that they can blend together to make a joyful noise into the Lord. It's so important they know what they're doing well so that they don't have to think about what they're doing, but they can just allow the Lord to flow and move. We have no excuse for not worshiping the risen Savior when we come in this room today. And the message that they gave to us today, powerful. Matter of fact, we ought to just follow up what they're doing right now by going to the Lord in prayer. He is a mighty one, a sovereign one. He's a healer. He's a savior. He's a deliverer. He, he is mighty. I said he's mighty. Do you understand that he can speak the word? And when he speaks the word, the sun will turn backward. The, the sun will stand still. He can speak the word and the waters will part. And you can walk across on dry ground. He has the power to turn things around. He did it for Job. When Job prayed for his friends, things turned around. Maybe you need to turn around today. I know a God who specializes in turning things around. We want to pray today. And I want us to do this one by one if we can. I want us to first pray for Billy Brazel. This is June's husband, Billy. He's uh, been sick a while, in and out of the hospital, back in the hospital. Got a lot of things going on, and they really don't understand what's happening to him. But I want us to pray for him right now. How many believe there's power in agreement today? Would you agree with me for Brother Billy and for Miss June today? Let's pray. Father God, in your mighty name, we come to you today praying on behalf of Billy today that you would reach down wherever he is at right now and that you would minister to him. Oh Lord, there, there's been a time or two that I've tried to call the hospital room and the phone just rings and rings and rings and rings and rings. But Father God, today we understand that, that we don't have to call the hospital room. We're going before the throne of grace and we don't have to let the phone ring and ring and ring. You hear us when we pray. The Lord declares your ears open unto our cry. We cry out for Billy today, Lord, whatever's going on in his physical body. We speak healing today in the name of Jesus. We curse sickness. We curse whatever is going on in his physical body. It needs to go in the name of Jesus. And the power of the Spirit of the Lord come down where he's at and bring healing and help today. Touch his wife, June, today. Give encouragement, give help, give peace today. We believe today you're working and doing that today in the name of Jesus. Would you pray for Ramona Brazel, still trying to get over that fall? Let's pray for Sister Ramona today. Father God, we pray that you would touch Sister Ramona today. Touch and minister to her and help her, Lord, in healing from that fall. Lord, it's uh, painful and, and difficult, the balance and everything else. We speak to that today. We, we speak, Lord, whatever's coming against her that's causing her to be off balance and now the needing of the mending of the bones, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would do that for Sister Ramona. Reach down where she's at today and bring healing and help today in her life and her body today in the name of Jesus. Help me pray for Carl Dean today. Carl Dean fell off a ladder about a week or two ago and still having a difficulty with pain and breathing. Help us pray for Carl Dean. Father God, right now in the name of Jesus, lay your hands on Carl Dean. 
Lord, you understand, Lord, the, the difficulty, the issues that he is going through because of this fall. But we speak healing in the name of Jesus. We pray that you would mend bones that are cracked or bones that are bruised or, or whatever the issues are, the soreness. We pray that you would remove the soreness from him in the name of Jesus that would enable him to breathe deeply. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, help him today. We pray. Touch Sister Linda Gale, Lord, as well today that you would minister to her. She's trying to be the caregiver and she's still doing rehab on her, her own back because of surgery. Be with them today in the name of Jesus. Encourage them. Wrap your arms around them today in the name of Jesus. I want you to pray for Shane Smith today. Shane's traveling uh, back from Niger. We want traveling mercies for him to be home safe. Father God, we pray for Shane who's traveling today, coming back, Lord, from an assignment. We pray that you would just put a guard around about him, a hedge of protection around about him. Watch over him today. Bring him home safely in the name of Jesus. We glad, we're glad that that season that he's been in is over and now he's going to be home. We just pray, Lord, that you would give him safety as he travels and then once he gets here, give him a rest and, and refreshing in his body today. We thank and praise you in advance for what you're going to do for him today. And Father God, I speak over this congregation today, Lord. I know there's got to be a host of needs today. I pray, Lord, even now as they speak out their need to you, you hear them as they speak it out today. And I pray today that whatever the needs are, whether they are physical, whether they are emotional, whether they are spiritual, whether they are mental or psychological, Lord, whatever the needs are, maybe it's financial, whatever the needs are, you're a mighty God. You have the power to reach down to where they are. And they have the ability to reach up to where you are. And if they'll reach up and you reach down, you'll meet them where they are. And you have the power to meet their needs need today. I pray you do it, Lord, in the name of Jesus. For those that need healing, heal their bodies today. For those, Lord, who may be going through some issues because of this COVID virus and it's affected them financially or it's affected them in other ways. I come against that in the name of Jesus and ask, Lord, that you would release your favor, release your peace, release your help today in their life and in their situations today. I thank and praise you for those mighty things that you have the power to do for your mighty hand and through your mighty name today. Now, Father God, we commit all this service to you. It's already been committed to you. But Lord, just in case somehow we have something else in mind, something else we plan, something else we're thinking, but that's not where you want to go. That's not what you want to do. We commit to you today, Lord. This is your service. You do with it what you want. You handle it how you want today. Help us, Lord, to know so that we will be faithful to follow you and do whatever you want done today. In the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for what's already been done. And I pray, God, that you continue to help us as we work and move today. In the power of your Spirit, we'll bless and praise and honor and glorify you today. In the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Can you just love on him one more time this morning? Just because you want to, not because somebody tells you to. Just because you want to today. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Anybody love him today? Oh, hallelujah. We've been trying since March to take in some members to the church. We were supposed to have done it the last Sunday of March, and Rona decided to show up, and uh, we were not allowed to have services. And uh, really, honestly, when May came, it wasn't on our mind. Our first service was toward the end of May, and it was our graduate service, and we wanted all our, our attention to go on our graduates. And, uh, and again, it's just not really been on our mind. We've been trying to... Uh, fill our way through and figure out what we're supposed to do and how we best do it and keep everybody safe and comfortable and and uh, but uh, we had another gentleman that started attending our church over the last I don't know a couple months and he's uh, wanted to unite with the church and so we met this morning and so I've tried to catch some of the other ones and just and verify I mean it's been since March and we've talked uh, to to everybody and and they went through that process and and uh, uh, so I'm probably catching some off guard, but uh, I, I wanted to welcome some people today. And again, because of 
kind of where we're at, our opportunity to, to do the right hand to Christian fellowship or, or to sometimes we just get them to stand and people right around there welcome them. Uh, we, we're not going to do that today. But maybe they will at least hold their hand up and wave at you so you'll know who you are. It's amazing to me how sometimes we don't even know who each other is in our church. Uh, people often will say, we'll mention a name, they'll say, well, who is that? Well, that, that says to me we don't fellowship enough to learn each other. So I want them to at least, if they will, just at least wave so you can see kind of who they are. And if you can, uh, at some point, maybe you can't shake a hand or hug a neck, but at some point, maybe even after the service is over, if you could at least find them and give them an air high five or an air hug <laughs> or something and let them know that you're glad they're part of the family. Uh, we welcome today Michael Franks. Where's Michael? Michael's sitting back there in the chair. Amen. He and Miranda. Miranda just got married last week, so we're thankful for Michael. Uh, Keith Braswell, he's not here. Uh, Scott and Katrina Alibal, at least wave so they can see who you are. Amen. They've been here a good while, but just never were, never had joined the church. So we're thankful for that today. Also for Jeff Tool, this is the man that's been coming, but Jeff's sitting back there. It's the half-brother of Sister Kathy Neese. And very, very thankful for what the Lord's done in Jeff's life. He, he was a very, very sick man, came close to dying. And when he came to, he wanted to talk to a preacher. And I was blessed. I think there was another one who actually uh, beat me there. But Brother Jeff and I had a great conversation and prayer time together and very thankful that he has recommitted his life to Jesus. And can somebody be happy about somebody recommitting their life to Jesus? And uh, he's been coming and uh, wants to unite with us. So we are thankful for these five who have uh, united with the Sweetwater Church. We usually do this at the end of the month, but since we missed it last week, uh, I wanted to do it, and that way maybe it'll entice some of the rest of you who might need to do something. You've got the rest of the month to catch up, and uh, as long as we do it by the end of the month, that would be wonderful. But we're always glad to have new folks. God bless you for all of that today. Um, today's going to be a little different. I've been having computer problems this week, so my computer's in the shop. And uh, I thought I had sent my slides to Brother Nicholas, but I sent them to somebody. I'm not who sure who I sent them to. But I'm having to do everything from my iPad, and it works all right, but it just don't quite work like my laptop does. So I'm not sure who I sent it to. But uh, maybe, maybe they're supposed to have the word today. I'm not sure. I want you to turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 3, and it's going to take me a little while to get there. And I, I hope my not wearing a tie today doesn't bother you. It's a struggle for me. I've wore a tie even when I cut meat in the meat market. <laughs> I had to wear a tie. And so when I would come home for work, I'd just jump on the lawnmower, and I'd cut grass in a tie. I've wore a tie about all my life, and so it's, it's, uh, it's different for me, and I keep feeling like something's missing. So, uh, but it's hot. There's some, some Sundays when I get home, I cannot get my tie off my head. I've sweated so much, my knot won't slide. And uh, I didn't feel like fighting that thing today. So I hope you will excuse me <laughs> for not having a tie on today. I wish I had the, the ability to, to kind of pull back my heart and allow you to look inside because this week has truly been a struggle for me it's been a struggle because I have been so unsettled in what I should speak today now I honestly thought that what the Lord would be pleased with is to talk to you about the last two years yesterday was, according to the state office and the records there, yesterday was my first official day, two years ago, as the pastor of Sweetwater Church. 
And uh, I just really felt like that what I needed to do is to go back and to remind you of some very early on things that the Lord spoke to me to say to you. And you may remember that, that part of that was talking to you about who or what would fill this house. You remember that? Who or what would fill this house? And we should not be surprised who or what walks through the door. Y'all acting like y'all weren't here. And I talked to you about that, that, that maybe it's people who have been here and had left, but they'll come back. It could be that the Lord is going to send folk through the door, and we should not be surprised when they walk through the door. And then I thought, after I go back and talk about that a little bit, then what I should do is cast a little vision about what God wants to do in the future. But every time I tried to work on that, I felt no release of the Spirit for that. I've also been collecting uh, workers' applications for, for our Christian education, and, and I felt like maybe what I should do is, is bring a message of encouragement to entice people to be reminded that we should be committed and, and pray for endurance. That what God does is He calls people and God is not slack concerning His promises to those that He calls. And that there is no, there is no, uh, there is no, um, God doesn't change His mind about His call on your life. And that He wants people who will be committed and endure to the end. And I thought, well, that's a good message. That's got to be it. But I felt no release to that. I thought maybe the Lord wants me to keep preaching about the coming of the Lord. Two weeks ago, I specifically talked about the coming of the Lord. Last week, I talked about don't worry about your stuff and how that sometimes we can get so caught up in our stuff that it will mean that we are not prepared when the Lord comes. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all the other things then will be added unto you. But I, I didn't feel released for that. I then got to thinking about a statement that was made about somebody attending a certain church and they liked that church because they let the Holy Ghost move. And I wondered, you know, are they trying to say we don't let the Holy Ghost move? And I'll be honest, I took it personally. It bothered me. Because I pray every day, Lord, please, whatever you want to do, you heard me pray it today, whatever you want to do, this service is yours. Hide me behind the cross of Calvary. Don't let me be seen. And whatever you want, let us follow where you're going. So then I got to thinking that maybe what I need to do is I need to preach about what do you do with the Holy Ghost when he shows up. There is a purpose and a reason why the Holy Spirit moves in a church. There's a reason why He shows up. Sometimes it's to encourage us, but it's not just to encourage you and make you feel good. It's so that after you've been encouraged and you feel better, you get up from where you are, you go out the door, and you begin to fulfill the mission that He's given to you. We had a revival in the late 90s, and people used to affectionately say, I can't wait to get to church to do some carpet time. What they were talking about was they couldn't wait to get to church and be slain in the Spirit. And they called the being slain in the Spirit and laying on the floor carpet time. But brothers and sisters, my question is, what is the Lord saying to you while you're laying on the carpet? What are you doing when you get up from the carpet? What is the Spirit leading you to do once He's put you down and put you in a place where you're quiet and still so He can talk to you? But I felt no release. Of course, I preached it pretty good right there. So yesterday when I get up and come to the church, I have no idea what I'm going to say to you today. Now, there are a lot of people who will ask you, have you ever gone to the pulpit with nothing to preach? And I will absolutely tell you, no. I've gone and not know what I was going to preach. I've gone and had three different things stuck in my Bible and praying the whole time, Lord, show me which one, show me which one, show me which one. But I've never walked in unprepared 
That's not the way I'm geared. So I'm begging God yesterday, Lord, you gotta, you got to help me. He goes, Lord, I am called by you to deliver some word to the people who are going to need that word for what they're going to go through this week and the weeks to come in their life. And what am I supposed to tell them? So the Lord led me to this passage of Scripture. And you're going to think when I read it, now what is God going to say out of that? Because it talks about prostitutes and a child dying and the threat of taking a living child and cutting him in half with a sword. Now, how is God going to talk to us out of that? Aren't y'all excited today? 1 Kings 3, look at verse 16. Then there came two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And the one woman said, O oh my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house. And I was delivered of, my child, of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered that this woman was delivered also. And we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. Then said the king, The one saith, This my son that liveth, and thy son is dead. And the other said, Nay, but thy son is dead, and my son is living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king, and the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, Oh, my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. And the king answered and said, Give her the living child. And in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. Now, if you're like me, this is not an unfamiliar story. No doubt we've heard the story of how the two women were having a controversy between whose child was living and whose child had died. And they went before King Solomon, who was the wisest man that lived or had ever lived at the time, and they went before him and said, listen, this is my child. And the other one said, no, this is my child. <clears throat> Sorry. Got distracted. One said, this is my child. The other said, no, this is my child. And Solomon, who was the wisest man that lived, said to them, I tell you what, since we can't decide whose child it is, we'll take the child and we'll cut it in half and we'll give you each a half. We're familiar with that story. But as I was reading through the story yesterday, the Lord began to show me things that I had never really paid much attention to. Here's, here's the things the Lord spoke to me to. Both of these women were prostitutes. Never really slowed down long enough to pay much attention to the fact that both of these women were prostitutes. We also know evidently that neither one of these women were married. That, that probably they, according to at least this part in Scripture, they're actually in the same house together. It appears that since they are not married and they are prostitutes, that they became pregnant due to their prostitution. It's also interesting that they were both pregnant at the same time and gave birth to their children three days apart 
from each other. Now you say, what are we going to get out of this? I'm so glad you asked me that question. Because it's here the Lord began to talk to me about value and sacrifice. You see, the thing that I noticed because I did not pay attention to they were prostitutes is that the Lord began to show me that these women had no value in themselves. There's many times that people go through their life and they have no value in themselves. These women were willing to sell their bodies to whoever was willing to pay the price they had set for themselves. They had no value for themselves. There's a whole lot of people walking around in the world today, and I dare say there's a whole lot of people even inside the church building who have no value on themselves because they've let everybody else dictate and describe who they are and what they are. You've allowed somebody else to determine what you're worth. It is not up to somebody to set your worth. It is up to God Almighty to set your worth. They not only had no value for themselves, they did not have the value of a husband or even put a value in a father figure for their children. Listen, God has a design plan that is best. I know that it doesn't always work. I know there are times when things work out in a way that there is a parent absent from the home. And I am thankful that God takes uh, responsibility and he enables the other parent who is still in the home to care and to nurture and to do what they have to do to raise their child. I applaud you. I am thankful for you. I am grateful for how God uses you. But how many knows God always has a best way? God's best way is if there can be the husband and wife in the home and the dad and the mom in the home. They had no value on themselves. They never even really had a value on who the husband should be or who the father should be. This is one of those things that I put on my list that I wanted on the screen because this is one of those good tweetable things. One of those good things you could put on Facebook. What value do you place on your life? What value do you place on the lives of others? Sometimes we're busy trying to, trying to put value on everybody else's life. We're trying to say, they're not worth that. They're not worth that. They're not worth that. That's really not your place or my place. What I'm supposed to do is put a value on my own self. And when I recognize who I am in Christ Jesus, then I begin to start recognizing the value of God's other people, of God's other children. I can never fully appreciate your value until I can have value in my own self. I may not be preaching to anybody, but I'm preaching to me today. Do you understand what the Bible says about you? Let me give you some scriptures. Psalm 139, 14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and thou art my soul knoweth right well. Somebody said, I'm going to praise you, Lord, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous is your works. How many knows that you are the work of God? Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm marvelous. I'm wonderful. We listen to everybody else tell us how sorry we are. How puny we are. How we don't measure up to this one or that one. How we don't preach like this one or that one. How we don't teach like this one or that one. How we don't witness like this one or that one. I want to tell you what the Word said. The Word said you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You are the marvelous work of God. If your hand will reach, you ought to just pat yourself on the back. 1 Corinthians 6 and 20 said you were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You were bought with the price of Jesus' blood. 1 Corinthians 7, 23, you were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. Acts 20, 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. You've been bought. 
I said, you've been bought. Galatians 3.29, and if you be in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promise. I am an heir of the king. Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah. You think I ain't much, but I want to tell you what I am. I am an heir. It goes on to tell me in the book of Romans chapter 8, I'm not only an heir of God, I'm a joint heir with Jesus. That's about as good as it gets right there. Glory to God. I like that song that says, I am who you say I am. I am who he says I am. Quit listening to all the other voices trying to tell you who you are and what you are. Your value is not in your giftings. Your value is not in your abilities. Your value is not in, in the fact that you can sing or teach or preach or speak. Your value is in who you are in Christ. Your value is that you have become separated from your sins by the shed blood of Jesus and because His Holy Spirit convicted you and you yielded and He washed your sins away and Jesus came in to be the Lord of your life. Guess what? You are valuable because you were bought by His blood. Your gifts and talents are a byproduct that He can use for His service. But don't think you're special because you can preach or you can teach or you can play or you can sing or you can sew. I've seen people become swelled up with pride because they thought they were so gifted. And I want to tell you, it's not your gift he's impressed with. His, his impression is that you're willing to recognize that you had to be bought because you were sinful, because you had sin in your life. And until you can recognize that you need a Savior, until you can recognize, really, I am nothing, until He washes my sins away. And once He becomes the Lord of my life, now I am somebody. Hallelujah. These two women had no value in themselves. During the night, both of them got babies. And one woman rolls over on her child and evidently smothers her child. I mentioned it not too long ago. Several years ago, our children's pastor and myself had to go to a housing project because a young lady had evidently in the night rolled over on her baby. And when she woke up and tried to take hold of the baby, the baby was limber. The baby was cold. The baby was dead. And I remember how they had the police there and the, and the forensics team there, and they brought in a, a, a baby doll. It, it was lifelike. It weighed like a baby. And they made that mama get in the bed and they said, show me where you were laying and show me where the baby was and show me how you were sleeping and show me where the baby was when you woke up and show me how you picked. Could you imagine being a mama and your baby's dead and you're having to go back and relive it all again? And all we could do is sit, stand there and watch it. We couldn't say anything. We couldn't do anything. But we could pray in the Spirit. I don't know what possessed the woman, but when she woke up and realized the baby was dead, and the other woman was sleeping good, she switched babies. You understand that she had no value in herself, but she didn't have any value in her own dead baby. She took the carcass of her dead baby and put it in the arms of another woman. She had no value even in the death of her own child. They woke up the next morning and the mama who had slept so good got up and she was going to feed her child. 
She recognized the child was dead, but, but while she was in grief, she recognized this is not my child. How many knows that even at three days old, you know what baby's yours? Maybe daddies don't, but mamas do. We recognize the cry. We recognize their smell. We recognize their features because we've already rubbed our hands all over their head, all over their face. Come on now. And she recognized this is not my baby. She said, listen, this is not my baby. This is your baby. You put your baby in my... No, no, this is not. This is my baby. That's your baby. So they go before the king. And the king goes through a scenario... You say it's yours, and you say it's yours, and you say yours is alive, and you say yours is alive, and you say hers is dead, and you say hers is dead. Since we can't get nobody to tell us the real truth about the thing, we'll just take the living child and cut it in half. And the woman whose child had died, she said, Yeah, let's do it. Let's cut it in half. This is what the Lord said to me. What you're willing to sacrifice for shows the value you have in something. The mama, whose child was really alive, said, No, don't kill it. Don't cut it. Let him live. You see, she put such a value in his life that she was willing to even let him live in the arms of somebody else's Somebody else's arms so that the child could live what you really value, you are willing to sacrifice for. My question is, is what do you value? What are you willing to sacrifice for? Well, Terry, I thought we was going to come today and have a shout and hallelujah time. We are! You'll never have a shout and hallelujah time until you recognize your own value. Until you recognize that what you place value in, you have to sacrifice for. Or else you're just going through the motions. This one mother was willing to let her child live in the arms of another because she valued his life and she was willing to sacrifice her parental rights so he could live. What are you willing to sacrifice for which you value? Let me tell you some things the Lord spoke to me about how it relates to our lives about value and sacrifice. Here's the first one. You need to be connected to people who share the same values as you. I'm going to say it again. You need to be connected to people who share the same values as you. Who value the same thing. Listen, my wife and I are married, but if she values something greater than I value something, I'm just going to tell you, it'll cause problems. When I talk to people who are going to get married, a week, sometimes we give them a little survey or a little test, and it's, and it's meant for them to answer the same questions, but then we lay their answer side by side, and when the answers are vastly different, we recognize that maybe they've not talked about that. For instance, one question is, how many children do you want? If one of them says none, one of them says five, Y'all going to have a problem. You might ought to talk about that. You see, one doesn't put value in the child. They put the value in their marriage. The other feels like that out of their marriage should flow children. And they put value in children and raising another generation. If you don't value the same thing, it's going to create problems for you. And there are many people that have invited people into their life they're their friends. They're their compadres. They're my BFF. And the honest truth is, y'all don't even value the same thing. 
You just like to have a good time together, but you don't value the same thing. If you call yourself a Christian, you should value Jesus. You should value the Father. You should value the Holy Ghost. You should value the church. You should value the Lord's Day. And I'm just going to tell you, people who are not Christian don't value the same things you value. You need to be connected to people who have the same values as you. Here's the second thing the Lord showed me. Sometimes having real love for something means you lose. Solomon said, let's take a sword and cut the child in half. And the woman who was the real mother said, don't do it. Let him live. She was willing to lose the child as being raised as her son because she valued his life. Her love for him meant she was willing to lose her parental relationship. You tell me you love Jesus, but other people that you say you love cause you to be away from him more than you're with him, you might need to lose some friends. You might need to you might need to lose a job. You might need to recheck some relationships. If who you're connected with, they say they love you, but, but their values are not shared with you, real love sometimes means you will lose. Third thing. Having that real love sometimes means it's self-sacrificing. Letting the child live did not mean anything to the child. The honest truth is at three days, the child may not have really even known who his mama was. All the child cared about is feed me, change me, let me sleep. The child really didn't probably know. Maybe he had a sense of his mother. Maybe he knew her smell. Maybe he knew more than we think he does. But at three days old, who really knows? But it was not the child that sacrificed. It was the mama who had to make the sacrifice. Sometimes as parents, sometimes as spouses, we have to make the sacrifice. Sometimes it feels nobody else is willing to make a sacrifice. Sometimes it feels like nobody else wants to pray. Sometimes it feels like nobody else wants to do anything. But what we have to do is press through and sacrifice ourselves and do what it takes to move on. If you're a parent and you've got children, sometimes in order for your children to live the kind of life they need to live, it's up to mom and dad to self-sacrifice. Woo! I'm preaching good. Sometimes mamas and daddies have got to push away from the table and fast. Sometimes mom and daddy got to lock themselves in the prayer closet and pray. Sometimes mamas and daddies got to go in the room of their children and anoint everything they lay their hand on. Hairbrush, toothbrush, shoe strings, inside the soles of their shoes, wherever they put their foot. See, we want the children to sacrifice. No, sometimes real love means we sacrifice. Fourth thing. you will be successful to the level that you're willing to sacrifice. Uh, I'm going to put her on the spot. Will you say in this microphone what you've been saying about a great church, a good church? If you want to be a part of a great church, then you help make it a great church. Okay. 
Okay. She must have been under the anointing. She don't remember what she said. For two or three weeks, I've heard her on multiple occasions, sometimes in the house, sometimes when we're in the car. She will say out loud, if you want your church to be a great church, then you have to make it a great church. If you want your church to be a good church, you make it a good church. If you want your church to be an average church, then you make it an average church. You heard me say it not too long after I got here, that we were going to live by the definition of excellence. Excellence is defined as doing the best you can with what you have at any given time. And brothers and sisters, I have to ask you, is God getting excellence out of our life? And is God getting excellence out of our church? It's quiet. I'm preaching so good. I'm not swinging from the lights. I'm not jumping from chair to chair. But I'm telling you, I am preaching what God has laid in my heart to give to us today. You will succeed at the level you are willing to sacrifice for. Anybody owe the IRS anything? Huh? Anybody? Maybe he just picks on us. Me and Uncle Sam's are not on speaking terms. I, uh, I get tired of having to pay Uncle Sam and I had to pay this, pay that. Now I got to pay the hospital. Sometimes you feel like you're paying everybody else and you don't, you don't have anything. So the other day my wife says to me, hey, you know what? We believe in tithing and we believe in sowing. So why don't we just sow according to what we want God to do for us? And then she had another bright idea. I'm serious. I'm serious. She says, you know what? We believe there's power when we take communion. We don't just do it to remember the fact that the Lord died and rose again. We literally believe that in His blood, there's power to heal. And there's power to move. And so every day this past week, before we leave the house in the morning, we've taken communion together. Oh, glory to God, hallelujah. You, you will succeed at the level you are willing to sacrifice for. You want a great church? Then you've got to sacrifice at the level of what makes a church great. You want to be a good church? Sacrifice at the level that it makes the church good. You want to be an average church? Sacrifice at the level to be average. You know what I heard the other day? Average is as close to the bottom as it is the top. What do you value? And what are you willing to sacrifice for it? You, all, you always sound so mean. No, no. I am, I am tired of the devil working on God's people to pull them down. The children had it right. The devil is a slow fox. If I could catch him, I'd put him in the box, lock the door, and throw away the key for all the mean tricks he's played on me. I mean, you'd like to lock him up and put him in a box because he's always working. He's always telling you lies. He's always feeding you a bunch of junk to try to get you to think about yourself differently than you ought to think. I've come to remind you, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You were created in the image of God. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are bought with a price. Quit listening to the lies of the devil. You are important to God. But take what God has put in you 
and do something with it. You have to see the value of yourself. You have to understand that sometimes because you really love, it'll require that you lose. Sometimes it'll require that you seem to be the only one who's self-sacrificing, but you will be successful at the level you're willing to sacrifice. For nine years, my wife and I paid an orthodontist every month. We were blessed to have two children with teethy problems. And we had no dental insurance. And so my son was the oldest, and he went to the, he went to the orthodontist, and he sucked his thumb all his life, so he pulled his front teeth and jawbone, everything, pulled it out. So we had to have braces. Doc, we, we don't have money to pay for that. He said, just pay monthly. He said, it's probably going to take me uh, three and a half to four years to get his teeth straight. So we paid every single month. And the month that my son got out of his braces and got his retainer, if it wasn't that month, it was the next month, my daughter went in. Glory to God. And we started all over. And we paid another four, four and a half years for straight teeth and retainers. You know what? We succeeded at the level we were willing to sacrifice. Both our children had good teeth. Both of our children had straight teeth. Both of our children had their problems corrected. But they didn't do nothing but lose their retainers. Do you want to know how we were successful? Not because they did anything, but because we were willing to sacrifice. How many of you want to be successful in your life? Let me see your hand. How many of you want to be successful as a believer? How many of you would like to be successful as a church? Let me see your hand. You, you know how that happens? Number one, you have to see your value. You have to individually see your value. Collectively, as a church body, you have to see our value. I haven't asked the question a lot around here. But where I came from, I used to ask the question a lot. If we were to close our church doors tomorrow, would our, would our community be impacted by our closing? That's a good question to ask us today. If Sweetwater Church of God closed her doors today, we announced we'll have no more services after today. Would our community be adversely affected because we closed our doors. And if the answer is no, we ain't doing our job. So, so if, we, if we see the value of ourselves and we see the value of our church, we recognize sometimes to do our job, it means because of real love for God and real love for His calling, sometimes we'll lose hurts me, pains me, makes me not sleep. Sometimes we have to self-sacrifice. Sometimes we have to do it if nobody else will. Sometimes I'll have to fill in when nobody else will. Sometimes you'll have to do things because nobody else will. It's until people start seeing their value. Until people start understanding the mission. Until people start understanding what we're about. And once they know what we're about, and once they understand their place, then they can join us, come alongside us, and together we move from average to good and from good to great. Our success will be determined by the level we're willing to sacrifice for. So, my list of questions that Sister Tracy comes is, what do you value? Well, I really 
really like my iPad and I really... What do you value? What do you value? What is extremely important to you? If they peeled away all your Apple products and all your Samsung products, if they peeled away all of your, your headphones, and they peeled away all of that, and all you had left is whatever that was at the end of the day, could you survive? Could you make it? What, what is important to you? Could be what's important to you is sitting next to you. Or maybe what's important to you is up on the hill or in the nursery. What do you value? Here's a question. What are you willing to sacrifice for that thing that you value? What are you willing to sacrifice? Here's one I think is important. What value do you place on the church? Where does church fit in to your schedule? I'll be honest with you, this pastor has struggled during Corona because there's some things that's taken place during Corona that I can't figure out if it's because of Corona or if it's because of something else. I try to listen to my peers. I got some friends who are at some of the largest churches in South Carolina, and some of them are at 30% of their regular attendance. And I'm thinking, ooh, Sweetwater's better than that. Hallelujah. But I love my people. I love my, my church family. I, I love every single person and I, I, I struggle with with wanting to make sure that we're all valuing the same thing because if we don't share the same value how does that work together we have to share the same value we have to we have to value this body we have to value this place we have to value her mission we have to value her her commitment we have to value her core values we have to value what God has spoken for us why did he put us here in the first place why did he give us our name outreach and worship sin we don't value who we are If our attitude is, as long as we're average, somebody asked, well, how many did we have the other day when we said a certain number? Oh, that, that was pretty good. If pretty good makes you happy, I'm just telling you, pretty good bothers me. I don't want to be pretty good. I was told, you know, close, uh, close only counted in horseshoes and hand grenades. I don't want to be close to right. I don't want to be close to good. I don't want to be close to great. I, I don't want to be close enough to God. I want to be as close as I can get. I want to be all He wants me. What do you value? One last thing about the woman. Or the women the proof of the evidence of where they stood was not in what they said because both of them said it's my baby it's my child the proof of evidence of the truth was not in what they said the proof or the evidence was in how they acted and how they reacted and Solomon said let's cut the child in half the truth of the real mama came out, not because she said it's mine, but because of her actions and her attitude. I hope you understand today that as your pastor, a pastor's role and a pastor's job, and I would even say a pastor's calling, 
is different than most every other calling. It's not the same as a teacher. It's not the same as, as an evangelist. It's not the same as necessarily an apostle or a prophet. A pastor's job is to shepherd. A shepherd tries to make sure that you get to the right watering hole. He tries to make sure you get to the right food source. He's watching guard while you're eating because you got your head down grazing. But when he's standing up, he's able to see if the tall grass is moving, if there's some kind of thing coming your way. Is there a snake in the grass? Is there a wolf coming? His job is to watch and keep guard. I'm telling you, I believe Jesus is coming. I believe we're living in the last days. I believe we're living in the last of the last days. I believe the Antichrist is alive and well somewhere on this earth. I believe everything that is happening is moving us in the direction to get us used to things, even though we don't like it. He's getting us used to some things so that when the church is gone and the Antichrist steps on the scene, the stuff he'll require will not be brand new to folk. So while we have time, the old hymn said, Work for the night is coming. Work for the night is coming. Well, who's supposed to work, Brother Terry? If you know Jesus, you and I are supposed to work. That's our value system. That's what we hold dear. Lost souls. People who need Jesus. People who've gone away from God and need to come back to salvation. That is our purpose in life. It's our value. And whatever we value, we'll sacrifice for. And our success will be at the level we're willing to sacrifice for. Do you know we pray on Sunday night at 7, the success of us reaching your lost family is, is tied to your willingness to sacrifice to help us pray. But Terry, we need some new folks. Do you understand your willingness to sacrifice to go when we hand out and hang on people's mailboxes and on their doorknobs, saturate bags? Our success is tied to our willingness to sacrifice to see it done. What are you willing to sacrifice for what you consider to be valuable? this morning it's not going to be a prayer line not going to be necessarily everybody come down This is one of those things that I really feel in my heart. It is something that the Holy Ghost has to speak to you about and your decision to hear the voice of the Spirit of God and to respond to the Spirit of God is nothing that somebody can make you do, somebody can require you do. It is something that you are arrested by His Spirit to do. And I'm saying to you today, if the Spirit of God has it all spoken to you, I would get up from where I am and I would come to this altar and I would lay myself as a sacrifice before God. And I would tell Him, Lord, this is what I value. This is what I'm willing to lose and self-sacrifice for because I have value in this and I understand I'll be successful at the, at, the, at the measure I'm willing to sacrifice. This is between you and God. And I'm telling you, I know we get comfortable sometimes and saying, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to pray at my seat. I'm begging you. This altar is a place where we not only lay things down, it's where we offer things to God. And I know, well, my heart's an altar.
I understand. And I know we can be, you know, we want to be careful about coronavirus. I understand. I'm just telling you, I believe that there'll be enough room that we can socially distance between each other this way and even between each other this way if a bunch of people come. Father God, in your mighty name today, I'm asking you to give us people who have a genuine heart to value the right things. To put a value on Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. To put a value on their church. To put a value on their family. To put a value on their marriage. To put a value on their children. To put a value on the lost. And Lord, anything that has a different value system than what they are declaring and decreeing, they, they place a value. It may require that they lose some things or lose some folk. It may require that they themselves have to self-sacrifice in order for the value to be placed in the right spot. I pray that you'll help some folk to understand that they will be successful to the measure that they are willing to sacrifice. Maybe you're speaking to us that we're not, we're not sacrificing enough and that we need to step up. Oh God, help us to follow you. We'll never outgive you. We'll never outdo you. Because Lord, your blessings will overrun us. Sometimes we are worried about, about having to lose this or separate from that. We're afraid that Lord, we're not going to be able to make it or survive. But what we don't understand is the blessing and the success of what we value comes when we're willing to sacrifice for it. You are the God of enough and then some. You're a God of more and a